Well, good morning. morning. I did not think that I would be standing in this spot again anytime soon. But you know, I've kind of missed it. Back while we were, for our visitors that are here, back a while back when we were having our ceilings redone in the main auditorium, we met here for a couple of months and I think we grew closer together, not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally. We grew closer together. We enjoyed that time together. But it's a little warm this morning. As I was sitting there, I got to thinking about a couple of years ago, we went up just across the state line up above Warm Springs to do a graveside funeral service in the middle of July. When we got to the cemetery, it was 103 degrees. Well, the preacher got there, a preacher that we had never worked with before, and he steps out of the car wearing a three-piece suit. Well, my first thought was, good, it's going to be a short lesson. (laughs) Well, he steps up and he says, well, I wanted everybody to see. He says, this is my funeral suit. He said, I wear this to every funeral. And he said, the reason I do that is because When I get hot and have to take my jacket off, that's my cue to quit. Well, 45 minutes later, he still hadn't taken his coat off. Well, as you can see, I don't have a coat on this morning. So, (laughs) Now, when the elders messaged me this morning and told me that we were without power, they said that we would do an abbreviated service. And so what I did, I went back and I found a lesson, and this is one that I actually did on the radio back right after I started preaching here at Pyburn Street. And as you know, those lessons on the radio are ones that are shorter. And so this morning, we're going to go back and look at this because I think it's a subject that we all can do better at. You know, we often hear people say that in the church today, we need more preachers. That's true. Or that we need more elders. Again, that's true. Or more deacons. Or more Bible class teachers. Or more missionaries. Again, we would say, yes, that is true in all of those instances. But I think that what we see in this area is merely a symptom of a larger problem. A larger need that exists in the church. The need is one that we find foretold by Christ numerous places in the Gospels, and it is a perpetual need that the church has had throughout every age of time. And that is a need for workers. We need people that will be active Christians, active workers in the church. One of my preaching heroes, Brother Tom Holland, I heard him make a statement in a lecture one time, He said that many of the issues that the church faces today could immediately be resolved if we would learn and apply one four-letter word, W-O-R-K. Meaning if we would all be active Christians. You know, if we were all going out doing our very best, putting forth an effort to grow the kingdom, We wouldn't see the situation that we see today in many places. We wouldn't see a shortage of preachers. We wouldn't see so many congregations going without an eldership. We wouldn't see congregations that their children have to stay in the auditorium because there's no one willing to teach those classes. We wouldn't see those kinds of issues taking place. But then you stop and you think with me for just a moment. Every week... In northeast Arkansas and southeast Missouri, Crowley's Ridge College is charged with trying to find preachers for around 30 congregations. Let that sink in. Memphis School of Preaching and Harding also send men up into this area. And sometimes there's not enough to go around. In Randolph County today, we have 17 congregations of the Lord's Church. Do you know how many are blessed to be overseen by elders? Two. Only two. Again, many congregations, they don't have enough teachers. And so their young people 
They stay in the auditorium. They don't have the ability to have those classes that are tailored more to their needs. But we need to remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For he said, it says, After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so what I want us to think about for just a few minutes this morning is what did Jesus mean when he said we need more laborers? What did he mean? What is implied in that statement? Well, first, it means that the church needs more people working to save the lost. You know, that's our mission, isn't it? To go into the world and to save souls. Most of us are familiar with Jesus' great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Well, this charge is one that applies to every child of God. We all are to be striving to reach out to others in some way with the gospel. Now, we've talked in the past about the fact that there's many different ways that we do that. It doesn't mean that you have to... Uh, be a public speaker. It doesn't mean that you have to be a Bible class teacher. It could simply be the influence that you have on others. But we are to be striving to bring others to Christ. Well, secondly, the church needs more people who are truly trying to mature. I think every congregation that you come into contact with, you will find people in those congregations that have been Christians for 20, 30, maybe even 40 years, but they have never matured from where they were when they first became a child of God. They've not grown. They've not put forth any more effort. It's almost like they feel, well, now I've been in the water. I've been baptized. I'm good. But they don't continue to grow. They don't continue to learn. Well, Paul... In his second letter to Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 15, he tells this young man, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But then we find also Peter writing a very similar but more detailed admonition in his second epistle, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, where he says, But also, for this very reason, give all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice what we see these two inspired apostles doing. They're stating very plainly that our main goal in life is to be growing spiritually each and every day. That as we study God's Word, as we apply it, as we add these virtues to our faith, we are to be maturing in our faith. Reaching that point where we are able to be more effective workers in the kingdom of God. But also... In the church today, we need more people willing to work together. I'm happy to say that I don't see this issue at Pyburn Street, but in too many places, you find congregations where people don't get along, where people don't like one another, they're not willing to help one another, they're not willing to, to partner up and do things together, and that's sad. It's not the kind of attitude that Christians are supposed to have. But whenever we stop and we think about the way that the church was instituted, it was instituted as a family. But the church is also referred to as a body. And anyone here that has ever had any type of illness where a certain part of your body did not function the way that it should, what all did that affect? It affected everything. Well, when we think about the church as the body of Christ and we think about each individual member as being a part of that body, 
Well, what happens if it's not working together the way that it should? The church is not going to grow. It's not going to thrive. It's not going to have the unity that God wants it to have. I want you to notice the words of John in 3 John verses 5 through 8. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a worthy manner of God, you do well because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers. There's the key. Workers together for the truth. God expects us to work together together to grow the church, to spread the kingdom. If we're not working together, then we're failing to obey the commands of God. The work of the local church should not rest just on the shoulders of the elders. It should not rest just on the shoulders of the preacher, but it should rest upon each and every person doing their part. And then lastly, as I said, I'm going to keep it short this morning. And lastly, we need the church to include more people that are ready and willing to work anywhere at any time. I think so often that we have this mentality that we have to set aside a certain time or that we have only a certain schedule and that's what we devote to our work. But no, we need to always be looking for ways that we can reach out to others, that we can be of need or be of assistance to others. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some of prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love." Once again, every member is to be functioning where they can, when they can, in order for the body to function as it should. We all need to start doing what we can. Now, we all understand that some may be able to do more than others, may have time to do more than others, may have the ability to do more than others. But the scriptures never tell us a set quota or a set amount that we have to do. It just says to be doing. Be working. Finding ways to build up the church, to carry out the work of the kingdom. And so as we began this lesson, yes, we do need more preachers. Yes, we need more elders and deacons and Bible class teachers. But we're never going to train up people to fill those roles if we don't get to work. We're never going to train up the next generation of leaders in the church if those who are leading the church today are not setting an example of work. And so I ask you this question as we bring this lesson to a close. As you've gone from day to day living the Christian life, Have you been working? Considering these things that we've talked about this morning, have you been an active Christian? If not, then I encourage you today to recommit yourself to doing that. If you've never obeyed the gospel, and this morning you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins, you're willing to confess Christ, then we encourage you to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if you are a child of God and you realize that you've strayed from the faith and you need to be restored, we want you to come forward and make that known. Or maybe you're going through a time of weakness and discouragement and you need the prayers and the encouragement of your brothers and sisters. 
we would love to assist you with that as well. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing.